Now, I know that during this quarantine period or this lockdown that quizzes have become very popular, but it's just really important that the world knows that I've been doing this since before it was cool. To get through the ACC exams, myself and Brett Gibbons would sit down, go away, give each other a topic, we'd go and make notes, swap those notes over and sit for an hour and just fire questions at each other. And initially we were awful, we didn't get anything right, and then over time you get better and better. Um, I thought that process was so effective at learning that when it came to sitting the American Chiropractic Technology Board exams, I did exactly the same thing, this time with Robbie Corral. So we would use WhatsApp uh, in between patients and just fire questions back and forth throughout the day. I really think uh, learning through testing and re retaining information through testing is the best way to go. Um, quite a few of you contacted me already to say that it's clap for heroes or clap for carers and heroes at eight o'clock. So we'll be taking a break. We'll stop a couple of minutes before eight o'clock uh, so everyone can go and show our massive appreciation uh, for their sacrifices and hard work. And we'll probably come back at about five past eight um, and continue the quiz. We have got five rounds of five questions. The format is going to be go through one round and then we'll go through the answers. Hopefully it will be fun, um, but it should also be educational. I promise all of the information today you have learned at some point. It might have been a little time ago, but I promise you it's all, all relevant. They are all based on cases that I have seen in clinic, probably over the last year or two. You have learned it all. You may not have learned why it's clinically relevant. So, uh, so hopefully that'll be useful today. I am awful at multitasking, so I'll try and keep an eye on any questions and, and stuff like that. When it comes to answers, I'm gonna be a bit of a uh, dictator and say, my, it's my ruling, um, so, so tough. Uh, also, PowerPoint has got super exciting these days. Uh, in a professional setting, we never get to use this stuff because it doesn't look cool, but let's take advantage of it tonight. So, is everyone ready? Everyone's got your pen and papers, you've got your gin and tonics, you've got your pajamas on, things like that. Okay, let's get started. Round one. In muscle testing, what does grade three represent? So in your standardized neurological exam, what does grade three represent in your motor exam? Okay, number two. A patient with a previous history of radiculopathy returns to your clinic. The pain travels from his elbow to his little finger. On examination, he has a loss of sensation in the fifth finger and half of the fourth on the front and back of the hand. He also has weakness of the hand. Neck range of motion is full and pain free. What is the lesion and where? So, patient with a previous history of radiculopathy, pain travels from his elbow to the little finger and half of the fourth on the front and back of the hand. Also has a weakness of the hand. Neck range of motion is full and pain free. What is the lesion and where? Obviously, you're self marking yourselves here, guys, uh, you know, on his rules. Number three, trivia. There are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. How many are in the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal levels? If I'm going too quick, guys, tell me to slow down. Uh, equally, if I'm going too slow and you're smashing this, let me know. So 31 pairs of spinal nerves. How many are in the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal levels? Question number four, a little slower, sure thing. The original number three was spelled dysdidocokinesia, but uh, I ran this through a test subject and he told me I was a jerk and then <laughs> no one's gonna get that right, so we changed it. Okay, number five, what percentage of patients referred to hospital for headache 
have a brain tumor. 0.1%, 1% or 10%. So they've already seen the GP, they might have seen a physio, they might have seen a chiropractor, and they still get referred on for, to the hospital for that headache. What percentage are going to have a brain tumor? Okay, guys, you can give me feedback. Have you had enough time to answer those questions? Do you want a few more seconds or, or are you okay? Mr. Paul. Okay. Oh, I did. Thank you. Um, in the case of a severe contusion, stretch, or laceration to a nerve, how many centimeters per month can the nerve regrow? So, in the case of severe contusion, stretch or laceration to a nerve, how many centimeters per month can the nerve regrow? Okay, and I've already done five. Uh, just in case I messed it up and you're wondering where the hell it was. Uh, so what percentage of your patients go to hospital for, uh, referred to hospital for headache, have a brain tumor, 0.1%, 1%, or 10%. Okay, let's go to the answers. So guys, I ran this through a test subject. He got 19 out of 25 correct, which is pretty good. Uh, however, I think he would admit that he guesstimated a couple of those. So let's say 17 out of 25, you're doing fantastically. If you get half, so let's say 12, you're still doing fine. You know, a few weak spots may you want to work on. Uh, and let's say less than half, you can use some of this wonderful free time we have to go and study. So number one, um, oh, I've put grade one there. I thought no one would know grade one, so I changed to grade three. Um, grade three is power to move a joint against gravity, but not resistance. So I reckon you all know four or five well, because that's the one we're always seeing. So grade zero is obviously there's no muscle activation at all. Grade one is there's no movement of the muscle, but you can see like a little twitch and attempt. Uh, grade two is if you eliminate gravity, they can move the muscle, but not against gravity. Grade three is against gravity, but not against resistance. Grade four against uh, gravity and against some resistance, up to about 75% of normal and grade five, um, uh, grade five is normal. <laughs> Good spelling of this diadokinesia, I like that. Uh, right, number two. Uh, the patient is describing cubital tunnel syndrome. Uh, give yourself a pat on the back if you get that spot on. Uh, ulnar neuropathy, ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow, anything like that is fine. Ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow is the second most common uh, peripheral nerve entrapment. Is classically happening as the ulnar nerve goes between the two heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Um, it kind of gets trapped in three places, so you can have proximal to the elbow, just distal to the elbow, and at the tunnel guillon. The clues to this case, because you do see it, well I see it a lot in clinic and I think you probably do too, weakness of the hand. The myotome for, for weakness of the hand, or sorry, if myotome for the hand is typically C81. Well, you're not going to see many radiculopathies that are going to hit C81. So as soon as the patient says, my hand feels weak, I'm struggling to do buttons up, undo jam jars, anything like that, you, you've got a pretty good clue that it's probably not a radiculopathy and it might be from brachial plexus down. The other clue that it was the elbow and say not the wrist is the dorsal branch of the ulnar nerve comes off before the, uh, before the tunnel guion and it's going to give you sensation to the back of the hand. So if a patient has numbness on the back of the hand, then you know it's before the wrist. Um, so hopefully I gave you a couple of clues. Number three, more of a trivia question this one. So eight in the cervical spine, I'm sure you all got right. 12 in the thoracic, 12 in uh, the lumbar, five sacral and one coccygeal. Number four, the one I miserably messed up. So in an ideal situation, someone who is young, fit, healthy, um, exercises, eats well, does all the right things, you can have up to three to four centimeters a month. Uh, if you went imperial or metric, I don't mind. I'll also accept an inch. 
So for those of us who aren't all perfect, an inch a month is probably quite reasonable. Now that might not seem clinically relevant, but it really, really is. If you've ever seen a rugby player who's taken a bad tackle and they've depressed the shoulder and damaged the upper brachial plexus, where you hit five, six, five, six is gonna give you your shoulder stability. If you lose your shoulder stability, you can't play rugby, right? Every tackle you're gonna have, you're gonna damage your shoulder. So when they're stressed about when can they go back to rugby and you know it's about an inch a month, uh, probably with them maybe three or four centimeters, it's not that far. So you know, probably within a few months, that nerve will be uh, will, will have gone through Wallerian degeneration. It will have re-innovated, and you're going to be starting to hit. <laughs> you're going to be starting to hit uh, all your proximal shoulder muscles. So hopefully, you know, you start doing your rehab maybe in six months in the back. If, however, it's a devastating um, radiculopathy, let's say an L5 radiculopathy, and you've really smashed that nerve. And that nerve now has to grow the entire way down the leg to get back to innovating anterior tip. Let's say they've got a foot drop and numbness on the top of the foot. It may not have time to get there, especially in tall patients. So I'm six foot four. Um, it may not have time to get there. And we've all seen patients like that. So they'll complain, uh, or they might say the foot drop gets better, you know, that motor aspect gets much better, but they say my foot's always been numb since. Well, that's the reason it just didn't have time to get there. What percentage uh, have uh, of patients with, uh, with headache have tumor? So it's only 0.1%, so it's still really, really small. Media and films and patients all associate tumors with headaches, but it's just really not that common. Far more likely they have a headache for an, a different reason. Um, in adults, if it is a tumor, the percentage of tumors goes together with the size of the lobes. So Frontal lobe is biggest, it gets the most number of tumors, then temporal, parietal, occipital, uh, in that order. Very rare to have a post posterior fossil tumor, so in the cerebellum, very, very rare. However, in children, it's the opposite. Nearly, not always, but a lot of them are in the cerebellum in that posterior fossa. So with adults, we're like, it's almost never a tumor if it's a headache. In children, a dizzy child has a brain tumor until proven otherwise. Right. Five out of five, very impressive. Clearly this is too easy. Another amazing graphic, thanks to the power of PowerPoint. Right, question one. Is neuropraxia the least or most severe form of nerve damage? So is neuropraxia the least or most severe form of nerve damage. Okay, again, tell me if I go too fast. Number two, damage to the dorsal columns of the spinal cord would result in a loss of pain and temperature or touch. So damage to the dorsal columns of the spinal cord would result in a loss of pain and temperature or touch. Okay, number three. Is the first sign of some cervical spondylitic myelopathy usually motor or sensory. So is the first sign of cervical spondylitic myelopathy usually motor or sensory? And for all the smart asses out there, I'm emphasizing usually, yes, it can present different ways, but the classic way, how does it go? An elderly patient doesn't have a blink reflex, so cranial nerve five. Why wouldn't you manipulate their neck? That's a tough one. I think, anyway, you might be, uh, you might be cruising that one. So an elderly patient doesn't have a blink reflex, so you poke them in the eye, nothing's happening. Why wouldn't you manipulate their neck? Or what is it an indication of? Uh, 
Uh, and yes, this is all this is all recorded. I can uh, I can post this at another time if it's uh, if it's any good. Number five. What is a very early sign of peripheral neuropathy? A. A loss of vibration. B. A loss of temperature. C. A loss of touch distinction. Or D. A loss of pain. So five, what is a very early sign of peripheral neuropathy? A, a loss of vibration. B, a loss of temperature. C, a loss of touch distinction. Or D, a loss of pain. Okay, have you guys had enough time? Ready for the answers? Okay, round two, answers one. Is neuropraxia the least or the most severe form of damage? It is the least. Neurotomesis is the most severe form. So neuro, uh, neuropraxia is normally a compression of the nerve or a mild blunt force trauma. The connective tissue, so the axon, the myelin sheath, the endoneurum, epineurum, peri, um, uh, sorry, endoneurum, perineurum, and epineurum are all intact. So it's more like a, a physiological block, physiological shock that's stopping that nerve from working. So what you're generally going to see is once that injury or that compression is removed, recovery can occur from hours to, to weeks. The average is about six to eight weeks. Axon tomesis is the next level up. It's where all the connective tissue, so from myelin chief up, is fine, but the axon itself is, has some damage. It might need to go through, 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 blah, blah, through some regeneration, so it takes a little bit longer. And neurotomesis is that severe laceration that we talked about in the last round. Um, that's where, in its most severe form, you, you cut through the whole lot. Um, you need to go through a period of Rolarian de degeneration and then recovery. It may never occur, so you might get just a uh, like a painful neuroma. You see these a lot in uh, hip replacements and knee replacements where that pain it just never went away the surgery was a great success but the pain remained and unfortunately it doesn't matter if you're the best surgeon in the world the moment you cut through skin muscle and other tissue you're cutting through nerves and that can be a consequence some authors say that 10 to 40 percent of people who go into surgery come out with the same or more pain and we think that might be the reason damage to the dorsal columns of the spinal cord it would result in a loss of touch. So the um, pain temperature is going to go anterior to the, to the central canal in the spine with dynamic tracts. The dorsal columns are going to give you your touch, uh, two touch distinction, um, vibration sense, all that kind of stuff, the feely stuff. Um, hopefully that wasn't too tough, that one. It's the first sign of cervical spondylolithic myelopathy, usually uh, motor or sensory. It's usually, usually motor, right? So it's going to start with a stiffening of the legs and perhaps weakness. And they often, the patient won't notice it. So it's just, I'm getting old, I'm getting stiff, my legs are you know, tight. Um, they might complain of cramp. The corticospinal tract is often the first one to get hit, and that's why you get that upper motor neuron signs in the lower leg. So what they're really describing is spasticity. The conscious control to the bladder runs either in or alongside that corticospinal tract. So often they start to lose bladder control at the same time. Well, how many old patients do you know, especially men, complain, I'm stiff and I can't, you know, I wee all the time. We urinate, whatever the professional word would be. Um, I think I've told a few of you this story again before, so I apologize for repeating, but I think it was a valuable learning uh, experience. I once had a patient refer to me uh, for balance, and she'd already been to a specialist balance clinic where she was told her balance was perfect, nothing wrong. We couldn't get her into the clinic. We only had three steps into that clinic, um, but she she had so little flexion of her hips, uh, knees or foot, that she had to lean sideways, and we had to basically hoist her leg up to get her into the clinic. Very stiff, short, shuffling gait. So it was obviously she had something seriously wrong. As part of the history, I said, any changes in bowel or bladder, you know, your standard question. 
she jumped on it and said, yeah, I have to, I have to urinate every 20 minutes. I don't leave the house anymore because it got to the stage where I just walked from shop to shop, uh, you know, just had to plan my route via where I had a toilet. Um, I, one of the few cases where I rang the GP and said, you know, I'm really worried this is myopathy. Can we, can we go on this? And, and he was fantastic. Unfortunately, uh, in the few days we were waiting for that emergency MRI, she fell. She had progressed, so normally it hits the legs first and then later the hands. She hit the hands as well, so when she fell, she couldn't flex and extend her arms, couldn't catch herself, so her chin took the brunt, and she severed, severed her cervical spine. She's now quadriplegic with terrible outcomes, and that all became came from the fact that no one recognized those early signs. Um, so they are walking to your clinic, so you try and spot them. Right. Less depressing, hopefully. Uh, this question is not a lot, a lot better. So blink reflex. So you're poking someone in the eye and they're not blinking. It is a sign of cerebrovascular disease. Particularly, it's telling you about the midbrain. It's telling you about the pons. That's kind of like the midsection. So you've got midbrain, pons. Um, sorry, I said midbrain. I made that confusing. It's telling you about the brainstem and it's the middle part of that brainstem. So you've got the pons, uh, midbrain, pons, and medulla. If the... If the small vessels in the ponds are starting to suffer, so you're missing that blink reflex, it's probably happening a little bit lower down, which is the medulla, which is your posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the one we're all scared about. It doesn't matter if we cause that stroke or not, you don't want to be involved. You know, when the spearhead from that media storm comes, you don't want to be involved with it. Um, so if you see the blink reflex isn't there, go and check the gag reflex, and if the gag reflex isn't there or you see a sloppy palate, for Christ's sake, don't touch their neck. Or if you do, just make sure you're documented to the hill, right? Five, very early sign of peripheral neuropathy is loss of vibration. So, um, loss of vibration sense, the, the important part of this is it will happen with age as well. So especially the longer the nerves, so not, the nerves that go over multiple joints are subjected to more stresses and strains over the years. They wear and tear. I know I'm not meant to use that word, but they do, they degenerate. And so we often will see a loss of vibration in the feet in older patients. So if you see it, don't freak out. Put that sign along with the rest of the signs and symptoms, which is, um, is the whole point of neurology. There are quite a few of us who take one sign and say, it must be this. And that's just an awful way to practice. Much better to say, okay, you lost some vibration, but otherwise you're fit and healthy. There's no signs of myelopathy or anything like that. You know, you're good to go. Okay. How are we all doing round two? That's from pretty good scores. It might still be too easy, right? Um, right, round three. Uh, how are we doing on time? In fact, guys, why don't we use that as a, a time to pause? Um, and we can go, go and show our appreciation for the, uh, the clap for carers. Uh, you can also go and fill up your gin and tonics or your wines or uh, put on your pajamas or whatever it might be. So um, I'm going to have a quick look through any questions or, or marks. Uh, and otherwise, let's meet back. Yeah, let's meet back at uh, five past eight if that gives you all enough time. Okay. Guys, I'm going to step away. I'll be back at five past eight. A 65-year-old woman presents with pain over her right temple, which is worse during the night. She can't sleep with the right side of her face touching the pillow. She complains that she's been feeling generally unwell for some time now and has general aches and pains. On examination, you note that her scalp is very tender and the skin over her temple is red. She has a light fever. What is the most likely differential? So a 65 year old woman with pain over the right temple, it's worse when her head touches the pillow. Sorry, worse, um, you know, yes, she can't sleep at night, pain uh, <laughs> touching her face to the right, uh, you know what I'm trying to say guys, I'm just gonna skip that bit. She complains she's been feeling generally unwell for some time now and has general aches and pains. On examination, you note that her scalp is very tender, the skin of her temple is, is red, she has a light fever. What is the most likely differential? A 
again, this is a case I've seen. Um, so if I've seen it, uh, you will too. Question number two. Are migraines classically unilateral or bilateral, throbbing or squeezing, frontal or temporal? You're going to need all three to get this one correct. So are migraines classically unilateral or bilateral, throbbing or squeezing, frontal or temporal? Okay, question number three. Three of the following symptoms commonly occur 24 hours before migraine. Which one doesn't? A, a low mood. B, heightened mood. C, food cravings. D, fainting. So three of the following symptoms commonly occur 24 hours before migraine. Which one doesn't? A, low mood. B, heightened mood. C, food cravings and D, fainting. Number four, just wait, I accidentally clicked on that, I'll give you a few more seconds. So number four, a patient presents with 20 minutes of acute vertigo, which gradually resolves and is replaced with a throbbing head headache. What's the most likely diagnosis? So patient presents with 20 minutes of acute vertigo, which gradually resolves and is replaced with a throbbing headache. What's the most likely diagnosis? Number five, is a tension headache usually made better or worse with exercise? Is a tension headache usually made better or worse with exercise? Okay, let's go to those answers. Round one, the old lady with temporal pain, that is temporal arteritis. Uh, temporal arteritis is not the best name for a disease because it makes it sound like it can only occur in the temple, but it can occur with any artery. So you could have occipital symptoms exactly like that, but in the occipital uh, area, which is a patient who might turn up into our office, right, complaining of suboccipital headaches. Um, and it would be very easy to assume it's just peripheral pain sensitization that's making it so sensitive. So that's why we need to look at the rest of those symptoms on exam. Uh, the reason this is such an important one to know is there is a, uh, a risk of blindness. Um, so if those arteries you know, close up, you can go blind. Uh, there's an association with polymyalgia rheumatica, which is why in the case you have, she has you know, generally feeling unwell, has aches and pains. That's that polymyalgia rheumatica. Okay, two, classic migraine, unilateral, throbbing, and frontal. So classic is that orbitofrontal headache, right, around the eye, on one side. But it's migraine, you know, on a massive spectrum, can present in a lot of different ways. Uh, it can be bilateral, it can be more of the head. Often the headache, if it's uh, more occipital, doesn't throb, um, so it could just be a bit like a tension type, it could just be a severe, constant pain instead of your classic throbbing pain. Uh, bonus points for polymyalgia muratica. Yeah, I, th I think that's probably fair. Or at least a pat on the back. At least a good pat on the back and a, an extra shot. Number three. So prodromal signs of, uh, of migraine can occur hours or even days before. So 24 hours before, uh, a patient will classically say they felt rubbish, really bad, low mood, felt depressed. Um, and they'll say, you know, I had a terrible day on Monday. I knew when the migraine started on Tuesday, I knew that was coming. Heightened mood or elevated mood or almost like euphoria can also occur. So they can feel fantastic. 
they can go out and absolutely smash their day, get all the jobs done, you know, do fantastic work, go to the gym, get everything done they could want to do, and the next day crash with that terrible migraine. The reason I wanted that to be in here is because at least patients say to me a lot, like, oh, you've been working so hard and everything you've done has been really helping. And then I, I went over, did it, and I gave myself a migraine. I'm just I'm so annoyed with myself. We don't want to add guilt or blame into a migraine presentation, right? They're already dealing with enough pain, and we know that guilt and blame is not going to improve their symptoms. Um, so it's good to know that, so you can tell them, oh, God, no, your migraine already started, so yeah, if you can do anything to help abort it at that stage, great, but otherwise, you know, it's not on you. Uh, other symptoms, I mean, the list is massive, but uh, you can have yawning, increased need to urinate, photophobia, phonophobia, problems concentrating, problems reading um, and speaking, uh, nausea, uh, muscle stiffness, fatigue, difficulty sleeping. So those prodromal signs uh, can be pretty, pretty wide. Number four. Patient presents with 20 minutes of acute vertigo, gradually resolves and replaced with a throbbing headache. Oops, uh, well that's your classic migraine again, but it's a vestibular migraine. Vertiginous migraine is also fine. Um, maybe even if you put basal migraine, we might accept that as well. Um, common cause, and there's a strong link between migraines and dizziness. So even BPPV and migraine have a, a pretty strong association. Um, what you'll normally see is in between the bouts of migraine, if it's not a very uh, frequent migraine, they should recover perfectly. So have the dizziness and the, all the balance problems that come with it, and they recover. But for patients with more severe migraine or a higher frequency, they may not recover. And so what you start to see over time is this declining vestibular system. You may even start to see signs of, of, of nystagmus and stuff when they're not having a migraine. We can rehab them in that in-between phase as long as you are careful and you know what you're doing. Uh, you can push them over the edge and give them more migraines if you overdo it. And number five, it's a tension headache made better or worse with exercise. There's a link between tension headache and a lack of exercise, so a sedentary lifestyle. Generally, it will be better in the long term. However, if you put an answer that's something like better in the long term or worse in the short term, that's fine too. So a patient who, um, let's say, goes to do a personal best deadlift and there's a huge amount of strain going through the, you know, through the traps and neck, maybe it shouldn't be, but there is, that might make their headache worse in the short term. But in the long term, exercise should make it better. Right, that was round three. How are we all doing so far? Okay, let's move on to round four. That's the exciting aeroplane. Right, question one. What is the average delay from the first symptom to diagnosis of an intrinsic spinal cord tumor? A, one to two years. B, two to three years. C, three to four years. Or D, five to six years. So what is the average delay from symptom to diagnosis for an intrinsic spinal cord tumour? A, one to two years. B, two to three years. C, three to four years. Or D, five to six years. What well does on the scores, guys, well, you're doing very well. Okay, question number two. The MITS phenomenon, you've heard the term before, occurs with flexion of the neck causing a shooting pain or electric sensation into all four limbs. What is the con what condition is it most associated with? So the MITS phenomenon occurs with flexion of the neck causing a shooting electric sensation into all four limbs. What condition is it most associated with? Okay, number three again, let me know if I'm going too quickly. A patient presents with tingling paresthesia 
in the fingers, toes, and lips. On examination, you find brisk reflexes globally. What non-pathological syndrome might be responsible? So a patient presents with tingling paresthesia in the fingers, toes, and lips. On examination, you find brisk reflexes globally. What non-pathological syndrome might be responsible? Here a few more seconds. Number four. A patient complains of fasciculations in his hands, face, and legs. How would you differentiate between benign fasciculations and motor neuron disease? So a patient complains of fasciculations in his hands, face, and legs. How would you differentiate between benign fasciculations and motor neuron disease? And question number five, is pain part of the motor neuron disease presentation? So is pain part of motor neuron disease presentation? Okay, that marks the end of round four. We have one round to go. Answers. Average delay for an uh, intrinsic spinal cord tumour is three to four years. So that tumour is sitting in the middle of the, of the spinal, co uh, spinal cord, and as it expands out, the first thing it's going to hit is those pain and temperature fibres as they decusate in front of the central canal. It might present, let's say it's in the thoracic spine, you might only get a loss of temperature, in which case the patient may not notice it for quite some time. But often you're going to get a diffuse, ill-defined, hard to describe pain a dangerous one for us right so a pain that often will follow that dermatome round so it'd be like oh, i've got pain in my mid back and it's just coming around to my chest it's just there all the time they describe it as a deep pain and as the tumor starts to grow and it starts to damage those nerves more and more the pain starts to become really quite horrific so then they'll start to complain of a very intense deep pain they will describe it with words like my bones are on fire it feels like someone is pulling the muscle off my bone um, and the pain could be horrendous. So again, that's when we start looking at our red flags, right? Um, you start seeing motor involvement um, much later and the dorsal columns um, seem to survive that really quite well. So you often don't see that sensory side of it for quite a long time. The myths, um, MS. So the condition it's most associated with is MS but anything that's causing myelopathy will do it. So um, you only get the point for MS, I'm afraid, but a uh, pat on the back or a, a little self-hug if you said anything like cervical spondylitic myelopathy or intrinsic spinal cord tumour. Number three, patient with tingling paresthesia, brisk reflexes, hyperventilation syndrome. Um, I've seen this case a few times. So uh, someone who's been described as having a, a like a functional uh, dizziness um, and all it was is they had hyperventilation syndrome. So this is where they are breathing too fast. They breathe out too much carbon dioxide. It basically puts their blood into an alkaline state, so respiratory uh, alkalosis. Uh, the sodium levels in the extracellular fluid are now a little bit too high and it makes their nerves jumpy. So peripheral nerves start to get a little bit tingly, uh, but motor nerves start to go as well. So this is where you get percussion myotonia. So you can take a, a muscle that normally wouldn't give you a reflex, like the belly of your thumb, give that a whack and you'll get a proper reflex. But you'd also see that, say, on the biceps, triceps, or globally. Um, for that same reason, reflexes become a little bit brisk. You can, uh, in fact, I'm not going to say anything more because I might ruin a future question. Um, so let's leave it like that. Um, it can also, 
hit the vestibular system. So you'll see that if you hyperventilate, you can induce nystagmus. Uh, and that's the case I saw. So a woman came in, she had nystagmus and dizziness. Um, literally in two or three minutes of just asking her to do belly breathing exercises. So two seconds in through her nose, four seconds out, all those symptoms went. You end up looking like a hero for something that's really easy. Question number four. How would you differentiate between a benign fasciculation and motor neuron disease? Really simple, the rest of your motor exam. So benign fasciculations, you can get them all over the place, um, but you're not gonna get any other motor signs, right? So their strength is normal, uh, their reflex is normal. There's no upper motor neuron signs, no lower motor neuron signs or anything like that. Motor neuron disease classically is gonna start in the hands first, arms, upper limb first, and later spread to the lower limb doesn't have to, but classically that is the way. And remember, it's that combination of upper and lower motor neuron signs. And in relation to that, is pain part of motor neuron disease? No, it's purely motor. So you shouldn't have pain as part of motor neuron disease. However, of course, if you're getting you know, loss of muscle with you know, spasticity and hypotonia at the same time, that's going to control your. That's going to change your control of movement patterns and posture. So they are obviously vulnerable to all kinds of pain presentations. So uh, no is the correct answer for that. Uh, but I understand if you said yes. Okay, that is the end of round four. Sad to say, people, we have one round left, and it is. I don't know. Right, you crushed it. Brilliant. Round five is a picture round and video round. So, question one. Patient presents with pain behind the right ear. You manipulate his neck and two days later, one to two days later, he wakes with his face like this. What is the most likely diagnosis? So patient presents with pain behind the right ear. You manipulate his neck, and I actually really say one day, but it says two. So let's say one to two days later, he wakes with his face like this. What is the most like diagnosis? Now, um, we're gonna go through answers on each picture just because uh, it just looks better. So, have you had enough time? I'll give you a few more seconds. So the answer, of course, is not that you've given him a stroke. This is your Bell's palsy or your facial nerve palsy. You can tell because the eye and the eyebrow are affected as well. If this is a real person rather than a cartoon, you see they might have a loss of uh, wrinkles up in the forehead. The whole face is slack. So a lower motor neuron lesion of cranial F7, you're going to get ipsilateral paralysis of the whole face. They get normally 24 hours, not normally, but they can get 24 hours before uh, really quite severe pain from behind the ear. For us, that's a problem because we think it's C1. So you go and crack their neck and then the next day, they ring you saying, what the hell, I've had a stroke. You know, you've, you've stroked me out, the media is all over it. Um, if it was a stroke, you'd see that the lower half of the face is paralyzed, but the upper side is okay. So if you say smile, you still get smiley eyes, but you just wouldn't have a smiley face. Um, a few of you have seen this case. Um, I've, I've had you contact me. This is a you know this is a case that does occur. The advice for that one is, you know, if someone presents with that kind of, you know, I take it super safe. If someone says to me, I've got pain right behind my ear. It's just here, and I've only had it for like you know the last day. I just don't do anything with the neck and, and, until I've waited two or three days, and I'm sure I'm out, I'm out of that period. Right. This video, uh, just in case ever gets this gets shared. Um, I have permission to use from Utah University, but you do not. So don't share it or use it unless you get permission from them. So what type of gait does this patient have?
Okay, that was long enough, right? So I'll give you a few more seconds just to think what you want to finalize on your answer. And the answer, of course, is a drop foot or a neuropathic gait. So you can see from the way she's walking that she still has that hip flexion. And you see how that foot, particularly from this direction, you can see that foot's kind of limp, kind of just being pathetic, right? Um, but she's got hip flexion, so it's not uh, it's not something like a muscular dystrophy where you get proximal uh, muscle weakness in the hips and shoulders. Um, you can see she's using her arms fine. She's not got this kind of like spastic positioning or hemiplegic gait. You know, the arm is perfectly fine. Um, and she's not having to circumduct that leg around, right? So she's able to flex the hip and swing the leg through. Um, if she'd had a, uh, like a, um, um, if she had spasticity, she might have to like swing that leg around. Uh, no, it's not an artificial leg. She's had surgery. Um, round five. Patient presents with severe pain often screaming out with brief bursts of burning pain. A cardiovascular exam is normal, an abdominal exam is normal. What pain syndrome might be causing this? So a patient presents with severe pain, often screaming out with bursts of burning pain. Cardiovascular exam is normal. Abdominal exam is normal. What pain syndrome? Oh, bust. <laughs> Oops. It's married life for you, right? Um, so what pain syndrome might be causing this? <laughs> Give you a few more seconds. Yeah, good job, guys. So complex regional pain syndrome, also known as reflex sympathetic dystrophy, Jeff. Good job. Uh, in the old days, known as causalgia. It also has a bunch of other names. So complex regional pain syndrome is horrible, 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 horrible disease, um, often occurring uh, more often in young women, um, can be a result of pain. So uh, like a nerve injury or like, I don't know, horse stamps in their foot or something like that, most commonly in the hand and feet. The pain will often spread. So let's say it starts in the big toe, it might spread to the ankle and spread up the leg. Horrible to treat. Um, we're all used to patients saying to us, you know, the pain is a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10, but they've walked into your office perfectly fine. They've done all your orthopedic exam perfectly fine. They've rolled over on the bench perfectly fine. And what they really mean is it's nine out of 10 in frustration or annoyance or fear, but not really pain. This is 10 out of 10 pain. Uh, one of the young women I saw with this would have to stop during a sentence to literally scream. They will often describe it as a burning pain. You'll see what you see in this photo, that it will often go red, swollen, but feel quite cold or clammy. You see abnormal sweating, abnormal sensation, and abnormal move, uh, movement. You can get atrophy of, the, atrophy of the skin, of the muscle, and the bone, because they can't put any weight on that. Literally, the, the limb will atrophy. Um, Tough one to treat. My experience with it being is you, you might take two steps forward and then feel like you take five steps back. Um, you know, that you know, relapsing is can be absolutely horrendous. Good. Number four. What sign is this? We'll do it one more time. Oops. I'll just give you the answer straight up. Either one. Okay, so for those of you who didn't look at the screen or maybe blinked, the answer is ankle clonus. So there's your upper motor neuron sign. Um, you can see it in the ankle and you can see it in the wrist. Um, good. I say, guys, we're on to our last question. Round five, question five, what name or name the cranial nerve weakness and which side is affected? So 
So name the cranial nerve weakness and which side is affected. I'll give you a few more seconds just to try and remember, so you can try and remember the names of the cranial nerves. I'll accept numbers. Okay, it's gonna be the left cranial nerve 10. So what you're seeing there is the right side of the palate is still strong and it's pulling to the right-hand side. The left side is sloppy, so you're seeing that soft palate is weak. Cranial nerve nine is sensation from the soft palate, so that's the sensation going into the brainstem. The motor coming out to activate the muscle is 10. Like I said earlier, if you see this in patients, which you will see frequently with you know, um, um, sleep apnea and stuff, you'll see sloppy palates, but it should normally be bilateral. You might see a bit of a difference between the two. Um, but if the patient presents with you know, a loss of length reflex, sloppy palate, um, and any symptom that might be associated with a stroke, um, you know, they might be just a bit clumsy, bounces a little bit off, maybe a little bit of slurred speech, we want to follow up with the rest of our exam and maybe make a referral for that. That's the end. I see I've made a bunch of mistakes. I've numbered number things the wrong way. I've spelled bust. Uh, and yeah, we'll give you a half point for anybody who got the uh, uh, who got the side but not the lesion. Um, guys, it looks like you've actually done really well on these these questions. Uh, I'm very impressed. So thanks for playing. Feedback. If it was too easy, let me know. If it was too hard, let me know. If you want me to spend less time explaining the clinical significance and just get on with the question, that's fine too. Um, I'm very happy to do one in the first and another one. I initially made 50 questions uh, until a good friend told me, what the hell are you doing? This can take hours. No one has time for that. So we shortened it to 25. So um, I have to do a second one if you enjoy it. I think it's a great way to learn. I really enjoy this process. About 21 out of 25 is fantastic score, John. Um, typically when I talk, I then get a few messages from people saying, where can they find learning resources online, where should they study, things like that. So if I have done half a decent job, maybe inspired a few people to go and learn, um, my own website, bcneuro.co.uk forward slash resources. I've collected there a bunch of online resources that are great. Utah University are amazing. They've got loads of free uh, videos on GATE, on neurological exam, on normal and abnormal uh, things. So the videos are a little bit dated now. They look quite like 90s. Um, but the neurologists that came out of that university, including the famous Shirley Ray, who I'm, all your, I'm sure you're all a fan of her, Shirley Ray sign. Um, go and check it out, it's really good. The American Chiropractic Neurology Board Exams, so acmb.org. If you go to resources, they have a recommended reading list for the board exams. All the books in there are phenomenal, um, including uh, this one, which is by our British neurologist called uh, John Patton. Unfortunately, he's, I'm not sure he's with us anymore, but he was a neurologist back in the day before um, before MRI and CT started to ruin the neurology, the, you know, the physical exam. So physical exam is a dying art. We are privileged to not have those things available to us, so we need to be good at physical exam. Patton is fantastic because he he did all the hard work before we had all those, those easy answers, so that's really worth looking at. But there's a bunch of other really good books out there. So guys, I, uh, I'm gonna end the video there. I will make this available for anyone who missed it. And I think if you've just tuned in, you can click back to the start and watch it all again, if you'd ever want to. Okay, guys, it's been a pleasure. Um, if you have any questions, get in touch, and otherwise uh, I'll have a look through the through questions, see if anyone else has any. Okay, cheers, bye.